We're not live yet, are we now? Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. This is presented by State of Mind Studios and I'm here today joined by David Lowe, the Chairman of the Celtic Trust. Welcome back, David. Great to be here. That's quite a few times now. Well, you're five always times, welcome. Five times, maybe. Uh, I think yeah. you're probably, other than myself, next as in appearances. Wow. In the appearance list. But the last time you visited us was at Catherine Park. We spoke yeah. a bit about some of the uh, information that you wanted to, to give to shareholders. And we, we decided at that time we'll have a follow-up and a Q&A, which allows Celtic fans and shareholders to ask questions as we stay online for around 40 to 45 minutes. So I'll keep a wee eye on the questions coming in here, David, and you and I will discuss the situation until these questions come in. So our last uh, podcast that we did was uh, very popular. I think Celtic fans obviously are looking at the situation as shareholders and they want to know more. So could you just give us a summary of what we discussed the last time you were on the podcast? Well, basically, the problem we've got as Celtic shareholders is that over the course of time, uh, more and more shareholders have become detached from their shareholdings. It's 26 years you know, since the first share issue, 1994, and over that period of time, a lot of people have died. Shareholders have died, unfortunately. A lot of people have moved home, uh, sometimes more than once. And they're given the fact that Celtic shares are probably the only share that a lot of these supporters will have bought. They're not really au fait or cognizant with all the protocols, rules, regulations. And over the course of time, they have not been able to update the share register. So they're not receiving a report and accounts. They're not having the ability to attend AGMs. In some cases, they're not receiving their dividends. And basically, it has allowed uh, those that still vote to concentrate to, you know, power in, in the hands of fewer and fewer over the years. So it's not a healthy thing. It's not uh, limited to Celtic. It's common in all companies. All publicly listed companies with a diverse shareholder base have the same problem. But in Celtic's instance, we have got over 25,000 different shareholdings. And the numbers are large and growing. So what the Celtic Trust is endeavouring to do is to stop this uh, from happening and to uh, reunite uh, shareholders with their shares, their dividends and their votes. That's basically the end game here. And it appears to be working because all the Celtic Trust numbers, membership numbers have gone up. So this is a good thing. Absolutely. Now, David, when we spoke the last time, obviously, as often happens on a Celtic state of mind, you get a lot of feedback and then people have differing views and ideas as to what the, the motive is. And I just want to make clear what the Celtic Trust motive and what your motive is for coming back on today to open up a discussion and engage with any Celtic supporters, shareholders or not. Well, first of all, uh, shareholders, in the eyes of the law, you know, do own the club. Uh and every shareholder is as important and is as equal as the other. So whether you're the largest shareholder or whether you're the smallest shareholder, you are a part owner of Celtic and you should have a say in the affairs of Celtic. And as I said, over the years, that uh, objective's been sort of uh, reduced because, of, because people are uh, unfamiliar with uh, the terrain, so to speak. So all we're trying to do is reunite Celtic shareholders with their shares, their votes, and their dividends. So that's a good thing, and nobody of sound mind could suggest otherwise. Uh, I was asked to get involved. I'm very happy to get involved. It's a subject that I know about. Everybody that's at the Celtic Trust, all the trustees, you know, are volunteers. There's no big uh, money thing going on here. It's a service that's available to Celtic shareholders. So it's a good thing. Absolutely. Now, with regards to the club then, David, you're working quite closely with them to try and re-establish that engagement with the shareholders, aren't you? Yes. You know, we've spoken to uh, Celtic and Celtic share these objectives. Uh, Celtic uh, want uh, to happen, what is happening, and there we will be working with Celtic to reunite uh, shareholders with their shares. So no problems there. Uh Perhaps Celtic should have addressed it earlier. That's the furthest they'll go towards criticising the club. It shouldn't really have got as bad as it is, but the problem has been recognised and there is now a plan working with Celtic to remedy the problem. 
David, we are doing this live to allow Celtic fans and shareholders to ask you questions directly. It's basically using the platform so that that engagement can be as open and transparent as possible. Uh, we did the podcast. It's a pre-recorded podcast that goes out as a message. Uh, people can then comment on that on social media and the like. But this is an opportunity today, and we're going to be online for 40, 45 minutes for Celtic fans to ask questions on Facebook. So just watch the, the video and yeah. comment. Comment with your questions, and I will pose them to uh, David here. Uh, in the meantime, you and I will discuss various other things because obviously uh, we both like a chat about Celtic and football and various other yeah. matters. Um, you came to my attention as a 34-year-old. Was it 34? Some, are you talking about the Celtic takeover? Yeah. A, a generation ago. Something like that. I, I'm not sure what age I was, but uh, it was er, er, the early 30s anyway. But prior to that, and what I found quite interesting, and being a, a big music fan myself, yeah. is that prior to that, you were involved in managing bands. Yeah. Uh, in the 1980s, I had had a very good 1980s. <laughs> it was sort of quite a... A brilliant time for business, stock markets, etc. So I, I found myself having done pretty well uh, out of the financial system, and I was working in a big uh, merchant bank. And my career involved would have involved, you know, working in New York or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I decided to. I was in the fortunate situation whereby I could opt out. So I, and I was living in Edinburgh at the time, and I made the decision to opt out of the greasy pole and to move back to Glasgow uh, to go self-employed in the middle of a recession. Uh, and I decided when I did that, that all I wanted to, I would only do things that I enjoyed. And the things that I enjoyed was music and football. Mm -hmm. So I get involved in the music business with a recording studio and and bands, etc., financial advice, and just having a good time, etc. And that's something I enjoyed. Also, the football thing is something that you know from previous podcasts that I've done is, is very important. I just love sport, love football, you know, love Celtic. So, and I, I love financial matters. So, I think I said in the previous podcast that I did notice that Celtic were falling further and further behind. Rangers in the 1980s. The game had changed in the 1980s. Debt was interest to football for the first time. Right up to the mid-80s, uh, there was a level financial playing field. Mm -hmm. There was no bank debt. And you basically, you were as good as the size of your crowd, your manager, and the number of people that watched you. So that's why you had a competitive Scottish football league. Rangers in the mid-80s were the fourth best team in Scotland. Everybody forgets that behind Celtic and the new firm. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons Rangers were taken over, you know, because they were in such a, a poor position. David Murray came in a few years later and then went crazy with all the debt. So it happened. Uh, Celtic had a very bad board at the time. They were inexperienced. They didn't see it happening. And uh, they were just falling further and further behind. So I, I, my view was, well, that's not right. I'm not having that. I'm going to try and do something about that. And that's the, that was the genesis for all that Celtic takeover stuff. It really started five years before. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the only guy that thought that. Fergus McCann was was uh, on the scene as were other uh, businessmen. But basically, the game changed when debt was introduced to the Scottish game. And uh, again, I was allowed to get involved in football, finance, etc., because that's something that's right up my street. So the music, the football, took me into the 1990s. And, and then the Celtic takeover came along, and that lasted two years. So that, that was great fun, yeah, great satisfaction to be had out of the end result. Oh, absolutely. Now, I was surprised, I think, the last time you were in off camera, we were uh, discussing how long you stayed at Celtic after that, because I just took it for granted. After the takeover, you probably moved into other areas and, and done your own thing. How yeah. long were you actually still involved with the club? Well, I was there uh, the whole, well, certainly the whole time Fergus was there, so... And it was a very tough time. Everybody forgets. Everybody looks back in Fergus's five years at Celtic with those tinted glasses. But it was really torrid. It was really difficult. Uh, fans were howling at the moon. And give him the money. Give De Canio the money. Give them all the money. Didn't have the money. That's what got, say, Celtic and Rangers subsequently into trouble, spending money they didn't have. So, you know, when Rangers were at seven in a row, everybody was nervous. When Rangers were at eight in a row, 
everybody was more nervous. And by the time it get, got to 10, everybody's just screaming, give them all the money, whatever they want. You know? So but like, you can't do that. So one of the things I had to do was go and do all these road shows all over the world, quite frankly, and sort of preach the gospel. We can only be as good as we can. We're not going to pay out money that we don't have because we'll go bust if we do that. And uh, it was a tough, a tough gig, but you know, I, I quite like all that confrontational <laughs> stuff. I don't mind standing up and arguing with with, with fans of a, of a think, uh, you know, what we're arguing is correct. So yeah. I, I was around doing that, you know, for five years behind the scenes, and that continued for a few years after that. But it, it got boring. It's very difficult to enjoy supporting Celtic if you're working mm. uh, in and around the Celtic scene. You're not really just looking at Celtic through the prism of a game and a result. There's a whole lot of extraneous factors going on. And I don't think it was a particularly joyful uh, period when I, when I was there. So I, I made the decision when uh, Alan McDonald left. And I think that was around 2000. Uh, and that guy McLeod came in and I thought, this guy hasn't a clue. And, you know, I'm out. You know, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to go back to a normal seat and enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. Turn up in jeans and get pissed. You know. <laughs> And enjoy it. That's the thing. Enjoy it, I mean, yeah. see, when you have a passion, as you say, you you take it uh, the the conflict that you say that that may have happened when you're doing the roadshow, but you also appreciate that that's because the Celtic fans were so frustrated, and there was a lot of passion. Passion was running high at that time. Um, signed the canal, giving the money, etc., cetera, yeah. etc. Cetera, that happened, yeah. and I think the the budget. I had a very interesting discussion yesterday. It was on the podcast last night about the budget that uh, perhaps the the manager had season on season. It was never going to be huge until Celtic finished the stadium and got everything else yeah. in order, was it? Yeah. So when the club was taken over in 1994, it was a, a hell of a mess. You know, it was insolvent. And it was going bust, and there was debt. Uh, but crucially, it did not have a stadium. There's a thing called the Taylor Report. A lot of younger fans have probably forgotten that. After the Hillsborough disaster and maybe the Bradford fire, and it was a big fire on uh, Bradford's ground, the Conservative government said that all uh, stadia, stadia have to be reseated, mm -hmm. or sorry, seated, in no standing at all. So uh, Rangers, by accident or design, you know, had an all seater stadium. Uh, Celtic didn't. Celtic had 8,000 seats in the, the main stand and the rest was terracing. So the board hadn't done anything about this. The board didn't have the money to do anything about it. Uh, the board thought they were Celtic. Uh, and we had to, or the boards, Fergus, ha had to address this very quickly. Uh, otherwise, we would have been playing in front of uh, 8,000 fans mm. or maybe benching seats, etc. you know, on the cheap. So which was probably what the board was, was were planning after think, everything else well, failed. Yeah, not not think. I know the board was planning that, yeah. and I know other people trying to take over the club were planning something similar. You know, doing it on the cheap. But you know, we're a big club, and you know, we're a professional club, and you know, we aspire to achieve big things. You've got to do things properly. So, and there was a big debate indeed whether Celtic should stay at Celtic Park or go, go to Canvas Lang or go to some Rob Royston or somewhere mm. else more. Uh, Exotic, but Fergus uh, was of the view, you know, we should stay at Celtic Park, and we should rebuild Celtic Park. And uh, if you build the stadium, the people will come, and that's what he and the board did. So we built sixty thousand seats, and I think it took four seasons. Might be wrong, four seasons to build. But whilst that stadium was getting built, remember that was soaking up a significant proportion of Celtic's cash flow. So for every pound you put into a stadium, which you have to, because you can't not, you're going to have less money for the squad. Yeah. So until that stadium was paid for, you then factor into account that the guy across the street or on the other side of the city is spending money he doesn't earn or doesn't own. So basically you've got two polarities. You've got a very expensive Rangers squad, and money tends to buy you better players, and better players and more money tends to buy you results. So that's what they were doing. It was unsustainable, but that's what they were doing. And it was becoming very nervous, the Celtic fans, because Rangers were at seven and Rangers were at eight. But whilst we were building that stadium, uh, we didn't have access to that level, the right level of money for the squad. Also, remember, it was a stand at a time. So the gates were like 30-odd thousand. Yeah. And we were at Hamden for a year, and they asked for a pound of flesh. You know, they really knew that Celtic didn't have an option, the SFA. I'm no fan of the SFA. They've never done Celtic any good turn. 
Uh, but they asked for their pound of flesh when we were at Hamden and they got it because we had no options. So it was a tough gig for Celtic trying to compete uh, with Rangers, uh, you know, getting near and near this magical 9-10. And the uh, Celtic fans then were as crazy as, if that's the correct word, the Rangers fans now. Uh, but again, the view of the board, the view of Fergus, the view of me is you should concentrate on your own. You should be the best you can be. Mm -hmm. And that's what Celtic focused on. You can't really worry about what the other opposition is going to do. You can just focus on your own team, your own squad, and be the best you can be. It was true then and it's true now. You mentioned there the, the season at Hamden, David, and I remember it well. I do remember it uh, quite, you know, when I look back on it, it's a wee bit different because if you've maybe been a season ticket holder for a, a period of time, that was my first season ticket. Yeah. So I always look quite fondly back on the season, even though the football on the pitch wasn't great. But we did get the trophy, we did win the, the Scottish Cup. But I've since read, I think the, the quote from Fergus McCann is that the SFA were mean-spirited in a lot of what they did to Celtic during that campaign. And one of the things that I found very interesting was, the again, the argument of the Irish tricolour not flying at Hamden. Was that something that was stipulated to Celtic when we played there for a year, to your knowledge? Yeah, I mean, there, there was a whole list of conditions you know, to do with uh, who has ownership of the discretionary spend. That's basically your pies and your bovril. Uh, to these are the conditions you must not fly, you know, the Irish flag. So, you know, that uh, these stories are all true. And that's only 1994. You know, I don't really want to go into them, but, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's still a provocative flag for a, a, a lot of the, uh, the uh, indigenous uh, establishment types that still permeate uh, Scottish football and other parts of Scottish society. It's a problem then and it's a problem now suspect it'll be a problem for a considerable time to come it's see, true oh wow see when you look at that stadium that uh was obviously it, it rose like a phoenix from the flames um was it everything that you envisaged was there anything else that you maybe think we should have done it this way or that way no i, I mean it's a fantastic fantastic stadium uh the three sides were built but still basically the original main stand every now and again a discussion crops up about whether you should the, the donut or whatever you want to yeah. call it by you know increasing the capacity to 70,000 you know in the main stand but I think uh, given where we are in the Scottish game Scottish leagues uh, I think 60,000 is enough and again if we were to start a major construction project you know that's diverting money from the team and then there's also the hotel and there's also the museum at the end of the day it's all about balance and priority mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't be, uh, you know, wanting to increase the capacity to seventy thousand. Well, I mean, obviously, Fergus had the uh, foresight building a sixty thousand seater stadium, David, when we were averaging probably in the in the thirties in terms of an average crowd. Um, how often would it actually sell out if it was to go up to seventy five, eighty thousand? That would be no, the question, no, wouldn't we it? We don't know. I mean, as recently as the Ronnie Dyla years, you know, yeah. there was it wasn't full. But you're right, right up until the early 90s, Celtic's average crowds were comfortably in the 30s. There is a consistency that goes right back uh, to the post-war years. Mm -hmm. Even when we were winning nine in a row in the 1960s and 70s, the crowds actually started to tail off you know, the more leagues we won because it was becoming a bit boring, uh, I, I would imagine. Uh, so you got it, you got to use actually a David Murray phrase, you've got to keep changing the menu. You know, if, if it's the same players consistently winning the league, it, for some, because you've you got a hardcore of Celtic fans and the hardcore are those that just buy season tickets in and out. But there is a sort of uh, less hardcore is, the, is, the, is the, the, the phrase I'll use that can take it or leave it. Yeah. And uh, I'm no good back type of guy, girl. Uh, and there's quite a lot of them. Uh, Gordon Strachan is a very successful Celtic manager, but... A lot of people didn't go because they didn't like his football. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Dial as well, manager of New York City MLS team. A very good guy, very nice guy. But, you know, he didn't captivate fans the way that the magnificent Lenny does. So, the Magnificent yeah. Lenny, I would call him that as well. I thought you were going yeah. to say the magnificent Brendan Rodgers there, David, yeah. which was probably his own description of himself. Yeah, we won't mention <laughs> people like him. His name keeps coming up. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, we'll start off with one. 
regarding the Celtic Trust, which is why we're here, but obviously yeah. we'll continue to speak about Celtic uh, in the interim period. Kevin Graham wants to know how are the Trusts going to go about getting more interest because he believes that previously they may not have had um, that kind of engagement with the shareholders or the fans. Well, it's difficult. If your team is doing well, there's less to complain about, there's less to moan about, there's less reason to uh, you know, join organizations if you're just get, getting the results you want. So the Celtic Trust has been around since 1990, uh, and we have had, by and large, a very good uh, 20 years since then. Very little to complain about. So that's why when things are going well, there's not really that much need to do too much. However, I think it's clear now that this ownership question is very, very important. There is a raison d'etre now uh, for the Celtic Trust. Celtic Trust is a shareholder society. Celtic Trust is doing something about the share problem, and it is a problem. And what we're doing is reuniting Celtic shareholders with their shares, their dividends, and their votes. And as I keep saying, this is a good thing. It's uh, right up the Celtic Trust street. It's why it exists, and we are helping achieve this fan ob objective. Uh, the Celtic Trust also owns Celtic shares. Uh, the more memberships there are uh, in the Celtic Trust, the stronger the cash flow is. That cash flow is used to buy shares. So the more members there are, uh, the better. The more cash there is to buy shares and the more fans will have a say in the affairs of the club. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing as well. It's very easy when you're uh, in a ivory tower boardroom to be detached and remote. I'm not saying this is the case. It's very easy to for that to become the case. Uh, and I, I basically see the, the Celtic Trust as a, <coughs> a fans representative organization that can help keep pay the board a, in touch with the views of fans. There are very many other uh, issues that the Celtic Trust uh, can become involved in, but this share thing is, is the, the biggest one mm -hmm. uh, by far. There are things like, for example, and these are just random examples, uh, the prospectus from 1994 afforded a 10% discount in the Celtic stores right. or to shareholders. That's uh, still a live offer, but it's not really used. It's not really, it's sort of being forgot about by everybody, including Celtic. So but that's something that the trust uh, could get involved at, uh, involved with in due course. There's also, you know, these fan areas that are developing around mm -hmm. Britain. Uh, I was in Anfield last year for the first time and, 20 years or so, and I was amazed at how, how good it looks. Last time I was there, it was a bit of a kind of thing of the plight word, you know. But, you know, we need to if there's going to be fan zones, you need toilets for fans. Yeah. You can't go into Celtic Park and come back out just to use the toilet. You know, it might seem not very important, but it is important. A lot of, uh, even since I was a kid, fans congregate outside rounds talk. Uh, uh, before they go in and everybody rushes in in the last, in the last five minutes. Well, Celtic are trying to develop, uh, as all clubs are, you know, fan zones. Yeah. Uh, and you have to have facilities. You can't just sell them food and drink and cross your legs for half an hour till you get into the ground. Mm -hmm. So things like that, you know, are, are we can work with. And there's a whole lot of other things I, I can't remember. <laughs> Well, I think one of the ones during the season that there was a few protests from fan groups, including the boys, who uh, I think are a, a kind of splinter separate group from the Green Brigade, David, and they were really pushing the 20s plenty campaign, which was, as it says, they were looking for £20 for away games, for away tickets, for all clubs. Yeah. So, you know, clubs coming to Celtic Park would also spend £20 to get their ticket. Yeah, well, again, the trust is generally supportive of that principle. Mm -hmm. However, enforcement is an issue. Getting all the clubs to agree to 20s plenty for away, away fans is a very difficult thing to achieve. It is something that the trust generally supports, but it's been basically overtaken by this issue, the, you know, the share issue, which yeah. is a big issue. But th that's, a, that's a good example of another issue. Another factor that's relevant, you know, is if you if it has an effect on clubs' revenues, you know, you have less money to to buy good players because you can't have it both ways. We'd all like into the ground for a tenner, but if basically if Celtic's you know revenues went away down, they wouldn't be able to afford the same caliber of players that they have just now. So it's mm -hmm. all relative. 
Uh, but it's a good cause, uh, more so in the environment that we find ourselves in. You know, when they're talking about the virus, yeah. we're talking about the recession that's coming around the corner. There's going to be a lot of people with a lot less money and there's going to be less discretionary spend. So it's a very live issue and, and we'll get around to dealing with that as well at some point. You brought up COVID. It's obviously been on everybody's minds for several months now, David, and it's great to know that you're keeping well and we can meet up in person in the, the confines of the studio. But there is a question here from Lawrence Connolly coming through on Facebook. And can I remind everyone that you can comment on Facebook? I will ask David your questions on your behalf. We're here to speak about the issues that we raised the last time in relation to Celtic shareholders and what this, the Celtic Trust are doing to uh, build bridges, engage with the club, engage with you as shareholders and fans. So please keep the questions coming in. But Lawrence Connolly wants to know is how well are Celtic placed to weather COVID? How does this compare to other UK teams? Well, f first of all, well, Celtic are very well placed. Let's be clear about that because they have a strong balance sheet, i.e. they have money in the bank. That's the most important thing of all, whether you're a football club or whether you're a business or whether you're a household or whether you're an individual, your ability to withstand what's going on is very seriously affected by whether you've got any savings or not and your ability to borrow money. So we're in a really tough time. It's a, it's a horrible time. Celtic are in a very strong position to see it through, but this can't go on forever. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that we can't all be buying season tickets for games we're not going to be seeing forever. Uh, so it's a time of great uncertainty, but Celtic fans have bought out their season tickets, all sold out. Uh, I think it's still a waiting list. All the executive facilities are all sold out. Uh, Celtic are uh, good for uh, this season mm. and who knows beyond the season after that because we don't know what the situation is with the virus. So we're in a very strong situation. I maybe mention at this point, um, without crowing, Celtic are genuinely in a financial league of their own. They have been very well managed and you know the board does need credit for that. Um, uh, but we need a league to play in. There's no point being the, the wealthiest team in the world or the wealthiest team in Scotland if you've nobody left to play because they've gone bust. So, and it's a bit of a boxing analogy. You, you know, a heavyweight is not going to spar against a bantamweight. It has to spar against a heavyweight. We don't have any heavyweight opposition anymore. Uh, you know, Rangers don't have the financial resources that we have. Again, a matter of fact, not a matter of crowing. Uh, and everybody else is materially financially smaller than that so i i think this is a major problem you know for celtic in the long run because it's easy for our standards to fall to the mean the average mm -hmm. than it is for the rest to get to celtic's level that's not going to happen and i include rangers in that so it's not on it's, it's unhealthy to uh, keep up and it's difficult to keep up a very high standard if you sort of know that if you play to your capability you're going to win the game it's very easy psychologically to take your foot off the gas and for an opposition team to sneak a result. Uh, so I think complacency is the danger for Celtic. Uh, but by and large, we are very financially strong. We can see this through as long as it doesn't last forever. Uh, but we need a league to play in, and I think that's the issue. Mm -hmm. It's unclear whether, for me anyway, whether the teams that are in the league have the financial uh, strength to see out the season if if you know they don't have the same level of money coming in as they have had previous seasons. So it's, it's worrying, uh, and there's no definite answer to this problem. Absolutely. The, a very interesting um, interview was had yesterday, and as I say, it went out last night, David. So for anyone who's not listened to it, please do listen to the podcast with Paul Smith that went out last night, not the designer. Uh, but Paul worked quite closely with Fergus during Fergus's time at Celtic. Yeah. So we had a very interesting discussion about the efforts to try and move away from Scottish football back in Fergus's time. Yeah. And there was the mooted uh, purchase of Wimbledon Football Club yeah. at that time. So obviously Fergus knew back yeah. then that the future wasn't going to be yeah. uh, in Scottish football. And yeah. as you say, we're more or less, you know, the domination um, of Celtic. As a fan, I still see us as potentially a, a European class club. I know that you would think the same. Business then comes into play and you think, well, in Scotland, it's not going to happen. 
How involved were you in any discussions or any plans for the, the move to buy Wimbledon? Yeah, well, again, I, I can talk about that. Uh, it's probably the statue, statue, statue of limitation. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and I keep mentioning my friend that sits next to me uh, in, the, in, in the, the main stand, Peter Riley, he's, he's 80. And I keep saying Peter tells you how awful Celtic were prior to Jock Steen, which is true, and we, we all know that. So why do I say that? So people of my age uh, or around my age have only ever known good times. I come in when Jock Steen came in and I've all, all, only ever knew Celtic as a team that won the league year in, year out. I'm talking about as a kid and as a teenager and regularly played in the latter stages of Europe's biggest competition. So for somebody of my age, this is the Celtic that I know. This is the Celtic that I want to see. I don't want to see a Celtic that wins the Scottish League year in, year out, then gets knocked out by a small team. And small teams are have big television revenues, and I can think of lots of them that are not nearly the type of world team that, that Celtic are. So my aspirations for Celtic are, a, are to see Celtic competing, you know, with the biggest and the best in Europe's uh, top competition. And there's lots of other people of the same age that have the similar outlook and similar similar aspiration and again the board are all of an age as well that presumably they share that view but it's it's very difficult to, to achieve when you're the biggest fish in a small financial pond it allows mediocre teams with mediocre fan bases to uh, basically outspend you for the best players because they have access to the tv revenues so this became a growing problem in the, in the 1990s and it's basically uh, continued right up to this point in time, and I will get round to answering your question, but the context is mm. uh, quite important. The background is uh, quite important. So COVID uh, is a game changer. You, you know, I'm not talking about all the... We all know how bad it is for, for health and families and deaths, and that's a given. But it's also creating conditions for change uh, and I do believe that all the television contracts, the gerrymandering, the geo-blocking uh, is going to be contested. I don't think the delivery of the end product, the television broadcast monies, are going to be happening in the same way that they have done in the last 20 years. Younger generations are not sitting in front of a big screen in the corner of the room. It is via devices, portable devices, phones, iPads, tablets, etc. Uh, this is the way to go. And I, I think all the geo-blocking and gerrymandering of TV rights is going to be contested. I think league structures, this is the key point before I come on to the Wimbledon and Clyde Bank, which I, I was an owner of in, briefly in the 19, I can't even remember, 1990s, late mm -hmm. 90s. So league structures, the menu, I used the phrase earlier on, changing the menu. The menu is boring now for more and more people. They're fed up watching your Chelsea's and your, your Italian teams, et yeah. cetera, playing each other umpteen times. You know, um, so I think there's going to be change there as well, jurisdictional change. And there's already discussions taking place about cross-border league competitions uh, and even before the virus, there was reasonably advanced talks and indeed the heads of terms about the Belgian League and the Dutch League emerging. So that was real in February, heads of terms signed, real discussions taking taken place. And that's a good example of the type of change that I think can be extrapolated throughout Europe. So, so coming on to Celtic being the big fish in the small pond, and stuck with a football jurisdiction that we didn't then and we don't now, me personally now, have, have much confidence in. Uh, there was a lot of uh, focus went into looking at the league rules structures. And it is true to say that prior to the World Cup, I've got my timeline right now, in 1998, it was possible for a team competing in a football league jurisdiction to actually play in the jurisdiction of another country. That was possible. It was possible for a Celtic to play in England. That's a fact. However, what, what are you going to do? 
So one of the things you could do was to buy a club and rebrand it. Now, this is a controversial subject because there, it affects fans of the club that's getting rebranded. Yeah. Um, it's quite American, you know, it's like the New York Dodgers moving to LA in the 40s or 50s. You know, basically, if you're a New York Dodgers fan, what are you going to do? You're not going to travel to LA. So it's, it's, a, it's a hot, totty subject. But basically, Wimbledon, uh, where a relatively new member of what was then the Football League. They played out of uh, Plough Lane in Wimbledon, which is a small stadium, which is perfectly adequate for what was then the fourth division. Uh, but they did very well and they sailed up through the divisions with a very, very small fan base. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they got to the FA Cup final by Liverpool. I'm, I'm, I might be wrong there. And it was cut a long story short, the two guys that owned it wanted to sell it. I think they wanted to sell it for like 40 million pounds. Right. So it was possible and they would sell it to anybody. Uh, I think they sold it to a businessman in Milton Keynes and it's now called MK Dons and the Wimbledon they now know is like a new club. Mm -hmm. So basically it was in the 1990s possible for Celtic to buy uh, Wimbledon, change its name to Celtic, change its colours to green and white hoops and change its registered ground to Celtic Park. And hey, presto, for a price of £40 million, you have Celtic playing in the championship, as it would have been at the time, because they'd been relegated. So that worked. Um, pair all the rules in existence uh, at the time. But football is, is, is a funny thing, because what happens is, or like any private members organisation, SFA, SPFL and their contemporaries, if you if they don't like a rule, they just change it. Mm -hmm. So just because it was in that was was within the rules at the time, they could just as easily change it to stop it happening. Because the fear that the football uh, authorities have is that it opens up a Pandora's box. If Celtic, and this goes back to what I was originally saying, if Celtic, you know, are playing have a have a jurisdiction, it's the SFA. And if the biggest club on the SFA's patch, look at it that way, is playing in some other dude's jurisdiction in England, that's not good for the SFA. So they don't want it, they didn't want it, and the UFA didn't want it because it would open the Pandora's box to what? Porto playing in La Liga or Ajax playing in the Bundesliga? You know, mm -hmm. where does it stop and mm -hmm. what does it mean for national teams? So uh that was possible then anyway myself and some other guys and this is relevant at the same time you know bought Clyde Bank which was in a a, a similar situation to Wimbledon that in that Clyde Bank had only been in the league since 1966 mm -hmm. and it came into the league in very controversial circumstances there is an irony here when Clyde Bank uh, Clyde Bank was originally East Stirling or East Stirling Shire I want to give it his correct name playing out of uh, Falkirk and in 1965, might be some people listening to this, correct me if I get my dates wrong, but basically they rebranded as Clyde Bank along the lines I just mentioned there, changed the ground, changed the strip, changed the name, and it all ended up in court and basically East Stirlingshire were reinstated and a new, use the American phrase, franchise mm -hmm. was awarded to uh, Clyde Bank and Clyde Bank joined the league proper. And then in 1966, and continued al along the way and right up until the 1990s. Steedmans wanted out, and we gave them some money for it. And they were like they were like a Wimbledon in respect that they had very low fan base. The Steedmans had sold the ground, and they uh, called Bowie, and they were nomads. I think they were playing in Greenock at some times, and they were playing in one or the other clubs up the Clyde so no fans no ground um, sorry not no fans a few fans so we basically uh, bought it and moved it to Dublin right. and we had basically hired the Royal Dublin showground in Ballsbridge and the idea was that the club would uh, relocate to the fourth largest city in the British Isles and Ireland is in the British Isles it's not a political statement it's part of the British Isles as is 
as is other islands in the, in the British Isles. Anyway, the idea was that it would uh, rebrand as Dublin City. It would change its colours uh, to uh, Dublin Sky Blue, and it would play out of Ballsbridge, and it had uh, like £20 million uh, pounds worth of new investment get into it. Mm -hmm. And the logic was that what that did was create a sort of Celtic League of a fashion in that having the fourth largest city, Dublin, in the Scottish Football League is a great thing. That's like bringing a city the size of Glasgow to the Scottish Football League. And with all the sponsorship and television uh, opportunities that represented, it basically doubled the market size of the, of, of the Scottish uh, game by taking Ireland in, into uh, a Celtic League of a fashion. But what you tend to find is that the SFA, you know, whenever you come up, come up with a good in, innovative ideas, you know, they, they don't like it and they'll try and stop it. So what actually happened, and it was within all the rules, and of course what it was also was a Trojan horse for Celtic. Yeah. You know, if Clyde Bank can move to Dublin, mm -hmm. uh, certainly Celtic can can take over Wimbledon and uh, relocate to Glasgow. So and saying all of this, I'm not disputing the fact that it's controversial, there's casualties, and even amongst the Celtic support, you know, have a variety of different views. There is a cat a camaraderie or a comradeship amongst football fans, you know, what about the fans of Wimbledon, what about the fans of Clydebank, and, and I get that but I'm interested in what's best for Celtic you know, mm -hmm. always have done and I can, can be pretty uncompromising you know, in that respect and Clydebank moving to Dublin would uh, open the door for, uh, for uh, you know, Wimbledon moving to Glasgow anyway, so what happened is they're all sitting down going uh, it was Ollie Byrne, the Irish Jim Farry at the time they were saying, saying uh, they can't do this, they can't do this. Then they get the lawyers involved, and the lawyers were saying, aye, they can, aye, they can. Uh, what are we going to do about it? We're going to change the rules. So what they actually did is before the 1998 World Cup, there's a thing called a plenary, and that's where all the football authorities get together and they change the rules and all that. So what they did was they changed the rules to prevent this, and they introduced a rule called, which basically said, if my memory is correct, the only occasion in which a football club uh, based in a, a, a jurisdiction with a football league can play in another jurisdiction with a football league is if it's in a trans-border geographic region not separated by a mountain range. Right? So, you know, Glasgow is nowhere near the border. Mm -hmm. you know, Berwick Rangers, which was in the, the SFL at the time, is right on the border, not separated by a, a mountain range. So they're, they're cool. Monaco's cool in France. Uh, uh, Singapore, I think, played in the Malaysian League or something. And then everybody went on about the Welsh leagues. But what they basically did was introduce a rule to stop a good thing happening. Uh, and that good thing, for me anyway, would have resulted in Celtic playing in English Championship uh, with everything that that meant, you know, with a we good prospect of getting promoted to the mm. what's now called the Premiership, and the rest would have been history. We'd have won the Champions League three times in a row, wouldn't we? Well, <laughs> you know, when you're looking at the uh, the possibilities, I mean, moving into the land of the riches, yeah. and obviously we give Fergus a huge amount of credit on a Celtic state of mind, but for him to also be supportive of that move shows that a bit of foresight in Fergus's mind as well, David. Yeah, he, he was into that then, as uh, as were the, the board. I mean, Fergus gets a lot of credit, and deservedly so, but he had a very strong board. Everybody forgets mm -hmm. that. Uh, Brian, uh, Fergus and Brian, uh, Brian, Brian Quinn, you know, like two very good chairmen. Uh, the best I've had. Um, but, you know, the board is... Uh, the focus at the time was, it was basically building that... When Fergus was there, you know, the five years, building the stadium... Uh, getting it paid for. And it was always going to be the case that as soon as that thing was paid for, suddenly the amount of money available for the squad he would have uh, increased dramatically, which it did. But again, we were always living within our means. So even if we could, and I'm just making the numbers up, double the size of our squad, you've got a guy across the street that's just borrowing money who treble it, mm -hmm. did say, or, or mm -hmm. quadruple it, you know, for every fiver they spend, I'll spend a tenner. Well, that was stupid then and it's stupid now. And, of course, they, they ended up getting liquidated. But the challenge, your original question was, yeah, this nirvana, holy grail, 
of playing in a bigger jurisdiction with big money and against the big teams and getting into the Champions League latter stages. I don't believe that can happen unless there's a change in the dynamic. It was attempted or considered in the 1990s, and it's been considered on and off ever since, quite frankly. I don't think there's a night that, not literally, Peter Lowell doesn't think, how do, we, how do we get out of this? You know, how do we get into a better jurisdiction, mm-hmm. given the fact that we're such a big fish in a small pond? It's the Gordian knot uh, that's still to be cut, a uh, Herculean task. Uh, and I, I think it will happen. But and maybe COVID will be the catalyst, as I said, with the geo blocking and the gerrymandering of the, the leagues and the television. I think it will, it will all come down. I think this the, the, the Belgian and the Dutch discussions are a good opening, uh, mm. a good opening to that possibility. Well, that answers one of the questions that we got. Thank you to Lawrence Conley for asking that. Is COVID going to be that route out of Scottish football? So I think you've answered that perfectly well. Please keep uh, coming in with the questions for. David Lowe, who is here to represent the Celtic Trust as the chairman. We are deviating a wee bit and speaking about Celtic and music and anything else that we uh, care to discuss in between the questions coming through. But uh, I must thank Stephen McComiskey, who's asking, is there any idea when the fans will be allowed back into the stadium and are Celtic putting plans in place for this? Now, obviously, David, you're not employed by Celtic, so you can't talk for the club. But uh, in your view, when, when do you think we can see fans back in? Well, who knows? I don't think anybody knows, but ultimately it's a government decision. It's not the decision of the SFA or the SPFL. It's when the government says it's safe to do it. And we have a very conservative small C government uh, in, in this country. So who knows? Is there going to be another spike? Uh, who knows? It's, everybody's talking about that. I'm hearing talk of the possibility of it happening in September, October, but that's just rumour. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> attach any great credence to that. Nobody knows, so there's no answer. Yeah. Now, again, deviating slightly, we had a fantastic suggestion during the week there, David, about uh, generating cash at uh, football stadiums. And it it comes back to your point about fan zones as well. Uh, We were talking about the reintroduction of uh, alcohol sales within um, football grounds in Scotland, because obviously it is available elsewhere in other sports. And the COVID uh, thing, bringing down barriers, etc., people may be looking at other ways to generate income. Yeah. And the suggestion was that everybody that's in the stadium is a season ticket holder, yeah. virtually, uh, and with your card, you can get three drinks. Yeah. Do you think that would work? Do you think there's a time in the future where you know responsible ad- adults like you and I can go to a game and have a couple of beers? I, I, th- I think you can. I mean, it happens in England. You know, I work in London a lot, and I go to English grounds a lot. And you can get... I mean, Liverpool is a good example of Distinct from London, you know, basically you can stand in the concourse there and have like a all kinds of exotic food and, and, and alcohol. And I'm not just talking about bulk standard horrible pint. I'm talking about you know, you know, your fancy beers, uh, and it is beers and cider rather than the spirits. Uh, but I, I don't see why not. I don't see why in this day and age our fans, you, you know, should should not be able to have a beer and, and some decent food. I mean, food is, is important as well. You know, it's why do people buy pies and stuff like I that? Know. <laughs> you don't go to the supermarket and buy a pie, but you will when you're at a football game. It's a bit weird. You know? How much has it changed really since the 1950s? The diet? Well, the diet has, and maybe the alcohol problem hasn't. I yeah. mean, who knows? At the end of the day, this alcohol issue is a government issue. But our, our, our board is very progressive, our, our Celtic board. I sound like a board acolyte now, I don't mean to be. But basically, we have got the stand-in section, which is a great thing. Mm-hmm. You know, Celtic were the, made that happen. Uh, when it comes to alcohol, that, that's a government decision. You can do it at rugby. Mm. You can do it at other sports. You know, why can't you do it at football? Football fans are not getting treated properly here. It's not right. No, absolutely. There's another question, and I think you've certainly touched on this with the Belgium Holland discussion. This is coming in. Thank you very much from Tam Mannion. What are the prospects for the Atlantic League discussions starting again? And do you think it's worth pursuing? I think from what you've said, you would look elsewhere. You certainly would feel that that's worth well, pursuing. You, you know, fans, lots of, if you get 10 fans in a room, you might get 10 different views. Mm. I, I'm not, Alan McDonald, who was the chief executive who came in. Uh, 1999 when Fergus left was very committed to the Atlantic League and I, I can't even remember who was in it I think it might have been the Scandinavian teams so if you want Celtic to play in the a different league I mean what is that construct that you want is it a Scandinavian league 
or is it you know Belgium and Denmark, for example, or or, or Holland? These are similarly sized leagues. The Scottish league is still a very big league. You've got your big five, then you've got the English Championship, which is the sixth largest league. Last time I looked, anyway, the sixth largest league in, in the world. But then just below that, bubbling under, you've got Holland. Scotland and Portugal are all much of a muchness. Mm -hmm. So what league, whether it's the Atlantic League, use that as a moniker, whether it's the Atlantic League or some other league, I mean, is that better than the current league? And you get different views amongst different fans. You know, why couldn't Celtic, for example, play in and with trapdoors in and ups? So, you know, it's not just an exclusive club. Celtic are saying bye-bye to the exclusive league. Sorry, Celtic are saying bye-bye to uh, Scotland. It's like there's a trapdoor in and out, mm. up and down. So would Celtic fit into a, a Dutch stroke Belgian league? Would they want to? Would the fans accept that, want it? Uh, or would some fans say, no, I'm not, I'm not having that? You don't know unless you try it. But I think uh, Celtic playing in a Dutch uh, Belgian league uh, is an attractive proposition and maybe more attractive than the Scandinavian version. But it's still not as good as a big you know, the big five league. I, I, I personally would rather play in the English league. Mm -hmm. uh, always have done, uh, always have thought that and still think that, and I still think that's possible. The question was a bit COVID. This is something that we've not, this is a, a major disruption of a size we've not experienced since the Second World War. Everything is up for grabs, everything. Television construct is up for grabs. I think that will change with technology geo-blocking, I think that's all going. I think your Amazons and your Facebooks, you know, could be bidding for sports rights uh, rather than the usual people. And I think jurisdictions are all up for grabs because clubs will go bust uh, and big football clubs need leagues to play in. Uh, and I think Celtic are a welcome addition as a global brand. It's a well-managed brand. Uh, you know, we are an addition to somebody's league. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't have any baggage, so we're an attractive proposition for another league. And I think if if there is going to be a change, I think it's going to it's going to be in the next few years or so, rather than at some indeterminate point in the future. Now, David, we have joined uh, together today to speak about the Celtic Trust yeah. and speak about the shareholdings and the, the issues that you have raised and to try and engage with Celtic supporters and shareholders. And it's something that you are welcome to come and do at any time within the studio and we'll put it out live so people can engage with you. We'll give the platform so that throughout this process, you can engage with the fans directly because it's difficult when we can't have a live event, for example, in a sure. Q and A, yeah. but we can certainly do it, do it online. We also have been speaking, the name Fergus McCann always comes up when, when people speak about David Lowe. Of course it does. He's were working together during that takeover and what happened thereafter. As a football fan, I look at the three managerial appointments made under Fergus's um, time at Celtic Park. You've got Tommy Burns and you've got Vim Janssen and Joe Venglos. Yeah. Who else? What other names did Fergus fancy during that period? Well, Tommy Burns was always really the the, uh, the guy that was wanted when, uh, as Fergus would call him, Luigi McCarry, he get sacked. He was uh, still young, he was full of enthusiasm, he was big Celtic fan as everybody knows and he was had some management experience at, at uh, Kilmarnock and there was a wee bit of controversy at the time as to whether he was tapped up or not mm. and Celtic get fines but that's neither here nor there at the end of the day it was always going to be a, a tough gig for whoever that manager was coming in Rangers had more money borrowing more money didn't have the stadium so you know I, I thought it was always going to be extremely unlikely that Celtic uh, could win the league in 95, 6, 4, 5, 5, 6, maybe even 6, 7, but we were capable of, you know, probably later on. Tommy was always there about, so I can't remember the, the other names so long ago, but he, he, I think he was right up there from the outset. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult relationship. I mean, again, business people and football people, the football is a very strange world. It's very herd-like. Everybody's very set in their ways. It's very conservative. It's not like any other business, as Anne Budge was finding out. As successive uh, 
as Jackie Lowe at Partick Thistle's finding out, I mean, you've got to play the game even when the game's a bit crazy. Mm. It's not like normal business. And a lot of American owners have found out that football is the easiest way in the world to lose a whole lot of money. But basically, you know, Fergus and the board uh, knew what was required here and had, had to be really tight and disciplined in pursuit of that objective. There was always going to be conflict, you know, with the football department, if you want to call it that. And Tommy Burns was in perennial conflict uh, with Fergus and the board, uh, ultimately the par parted ways. Vim Janssen the, 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 was the same. You know, football people think, you know, they're the be all and the end all. And to a lar large extent they are, but they're not, they're not, you know, practically the only people. So there's always going to be disputes. I've never met a manager yet, and I know lots of managers that was always, was never three. Every manager is always three players short matter who he is mm -hmm. you know, and uh, always wants to overpay the, the the players and always wants to always want to give in to the players and this is always going on at Celtic at the end of the day we're not going to rescue a bust company just to make it bust again uh, so there was always conflict Vim Janssen I mean Hugh Keevans is famous for announcing it's Jorge some Portuguese dude I've forgotten his name George, Arthur George. That's right, yeah. Uh, front page or back page news. It's Arthur George. Uh, and everybody's waiting for Arthur George to come through that wee door in the Celtic boardroom. And always, this is true story. And then the door opens and this wee curly-haired guy comes in and some guy from the sun and goes, Christ, it's Robert Pritz has got the Celtic job. Now, a lot of people, if you're old enough, you'll know who Robert Pritz is. <laughs> yeah. He was a wee curly guy with curly, curly hair. Played for Rangers, number 10, Swedish. So... It was it, he. He was there or thereabouts. Goose or Hoos, he think was in and around the scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's, it's a matter of record that uh, Dermot Desmond didn't see the fire in his eyes. Uh, he never got the gig. But I'm going by 2001, so I, I, I don't know what's happened ever since. I do know the situation. Uh, I think I'm allowed to say this, and I won't impersonate Fergus, but. Kenny Douglish, the combo, Kenny Douglish, John Barnes, that would never have happened in a million years uh, if Fergus McCann had been there. And it was almost like, don't appoint those two, don't, don't appoint these guys or that guy. Uh, and it's, it's like, you go in, Fergus, and then Kenny Douglish is through the other door. You, you know, Kenny, Kenny Douglish, great guy, great Celtic player. I think he lost the fire in his belly by then, and Appointing a rookie manager, it's the same with Gerard. I mean, he was the best player in the world and the the, the worst manager in the world. And uh, Barnes never had it, uh, and he never went on to do anything. No. Briefly managed MK Dons, briefly managed Tranmere, and you know he just didn't have it. There's nothing wrong with that. Rookie managers are a bad idea, as Rangers have found out. Every time Celtic have done it, other than Neil Lennon, I think it's been a bad idea. You know, with Liam Brady, and of course. John Barnes, the aforementioned. But I'm glad you brought that up because um, I had a wee chat with John a few weeks ago and it was quite controversial. So I'm glad you've brought that up yourself, David. The whole purpose of today's discussion was to talk about the Celtic Trust and your involvement with the shareholders in relation uh, to the dividends that obviously uh, we've spoken about twice now. We'll be speaking about it again. But in summary, for anyone who is watching or may watch this on YouTube later on once it's been uploaded, in summary, what is the message to Celtic shareholders today? If you're not sure, if a shareholder is not sure whether he still got shares or owns shares, you should join the Celtic Trust and we will check the share register and tell them how to go about re-engaging with their shares. Uh, it can be quite intimidating. Again, this is for an ivory tower principle. Everybody assumes in the boardroom or most boardrooms, they're not talking the Celtic ones, that, oh, you just do this or you just do that. But if you've never done it before, it's not quite as simple as that. It's a bit of a, a maze, but the Celtic Trust can reunite Celtic shareholders with their shares. Uh, it can also reunite Celtic shareholders with their dividends. Most Celtic shareholders bought their shares in 1994. They get two types of shares, ordinary shares, which allow you to vote and attend the AGMs, and a thing called preference shares, which pay a 3.6 pen dividend. The most common uh, shareholding was the smallest one. It was 500 of these shares. So that's an £18 a year dividend. Now, there's some of these shares still sitting in the reg 
company registrar's bank account. 24 years, they paid dividends since 1997. 24 years, up to 24 years of shareholders' dividends are sitting in the share register's bank account waiting for the shareholder to get it. And that's 400 quid. So if you've moved home uh, and not updated your share register up to 24 years of dividend, 400 quid is sitting in a bank account waiting for you. Less years is less money. But once you have re-registered your shares, you've updated your address, they'll, they'll send you the money. Mm -hmm. And you remember your shares are worth 1,200 quid as well. So you want to know, you want to be in touch with that uh, shareholding. Uh, so we can help you. Celtic Trust can help you reunite with your shares. The numbers since we've re we launched this are large, though, and we're having to prioritise Celtic Trust members because mm -hmm. there's just so many. So join the Celtic Trust, be at the top of the queue. Now, David, I really appreciate you coming along to our studio here at State of Mind. I hope you enjoy the palatial surroundings that you uh, were met by when you walked through the door. It's always a pleasure to talk to you about Celtic and business, and you are welcome back anytime to put any message to the Celtic support or shareholders group. So thank you very much for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.